All right, well, we can go ahead and get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our November of 2020 Global One Health Initiative webinar, supported by the NIH Fogarty International Center. Our theme for this webinar will be parasites, or sorry, parasitology and vector-borne disease. And we'll be hearing from speakers, Dr. David Bruce Kahn from Berry College here in the United States, presenting Global One Health Monitoring of Parasitic and Vector-Borne Diseases, and Dr. Sebastián Muñoz Leal from the University of Concepción in Chile, presenting soft ticks as human parasites in South America, a One Health perspective. Our panel discussion moderator will be our own Global One Health Initiative member, Dr. Rafael Vieira of the Federal University of Paraná in Brazil, who specializes in emerging tick-borne pathogens and other zoonotic vector-borne diseases. And Dr. Rafael serves as an adjunct professor of the Department of Veterinary Medicine, as well as coordinator of the graduate program in veterinary sciences at the Federal University of Paraná. And he currently leads multiple research projects across the globe. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Vieira. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blankley, for the introduction. And I want to uh, give everyone a good morning from Brazil and good afternoon and night uh, all over the world. And I'm very glad to be uh, here discussing again about uh, One Health and mainly vector-borne disease. So I would like to present our first speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, David Kahn. He is a PhD in parasitology at the University of Cincinnati. Dr. Kahn is the Henry, Henry Good Professor of Biology at the Berry College One Health Center and Associate of the Invertebrate Zo Zoology at the Harvard University Museum of Comparative Zoology. He's also a senior scientific advisor in international health and biodefense for the USA department. And he serves uh, on editorial boards of several scientific journals, including the journal One Health. Professor Kahn has been an active researcher for more than 40 years in issues related to One Health. He has taught and conducted research around the world uh, where he focused on building numerous international collaborating teams for global uh, monitoring of infectious disease. His research, uh, which is, uh, has resulted in more than 40, 400 published works, spans topics ranging from foodborne transmission of helminthic parasites to environmental dissemination of waterborne parasites, biology of vectors and vector-borne disease, and the relationship between biological invasions and emerging zoonotic disease. As Dean of the Sciences at Barrett College, Professor Kahn led the formation of the One Health Center and the full, first full bachelor's degrees program in One Health Science. Dr. Kahn, it's a great pleasure for us uh, from Go High uh, to host you today. Okay, thank you very much. So are you ready now, uh, Laura, for me to take off? Or? Yep, yep, you can go ahead and share your screen. Very good, okay. Uh, let me go ahead then and share this and if you will just confirm if it comes up. And. Yep, we can see it and if you could just, yep, perfect. Okay. And you can see my, my mouse moving my cursor? Yes. I hope I will be putting things out. Okay, let me start off by just thanking you very much. Thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks a lot for inviting me to be a part of this. I have really enjoyed these webinars. Uh, it's great to be back in Ohio, if only virtually, as I uh, lived there for many years and my wife is from there. Uh, but, uh, I'm gonna be sharing uh, today with you about our programs here, primarily at the Berry College One Health Center. And uh, let me start by saying that Programs are designed as we are an undergraduate institution primarily. Uh, we did begin this uh, full bachelor's degree program in One Health Science several years ago. It has been very highly enrolled. We're, we're sending a lot of our students off into graduate work and professional work in medical and veterinary schools uh, in, uh, with real interest in One Health. So we hope to help it. We're starting this new pipeline of, of very talented scientists coming up. Uh, let me start by saying a little bit about the Berry College One Health Center. Uh, one of the things that we have that is uh, an unusual resource is a very large tract of land. Uh, Berry College, in fact, though we are a small college in terms of numbers of students, uh, we have the largest uh, physical university campus in the United States. That is uh, over 107 square kilometers. 
So with 107 square kilometers and with land that also includes various farms for various types of animals, lots of wildlife, uh, rivers, lakes, and um, many other habitats, uh, we're in a perfect location, not only to do research ourselves on One Health, but to invite uh, visiting investigators from other universities, other institutions. Also our proximity to Atlanta, which is only about 100 kilometers away, uh, means that we've got uh, access to the Centers for Disease Control. And in fact, we conduct collaborative work here on our campus with other institutions. CDC is one of the primary ones. Uh, in the lower right down here, you can see where we're located. It's a very strategic location because as you'll see later, we are at the edge of the Piedmont uh, north of the coastal plain, both the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and it gives us a strategic location for understanding the impact of topography and climate on One Health issues. Uh, here's just a little framework to show you about our uh, uh, about our campus once again, uh, lots of wildlife. We have a major beef center. Uh, we have a dairy. Uh, we have sheep, goats. We have also poultry, and uh, we have also vegetable gardens and so forth. In addition to the wildlife, such as the Canada geese, the coyotes, uh, and so on. So we have access to a lot of material to work with. Again, one of the main things we do is we invite people from other institutions to come and work with us, and then we reciprocally go to those institutions. So the institutions that you see here from uh, various places in the United States, as well as around the world, uh, we have had groups from, come from there to do research with us and studies with us and our students, but we also have gone back uh, and, and spent time in their countries because it has been our goal to make this a truly global uh, facility. And that's one of the things that really resonates with me about the Ohio State University uh, system, the fact that they really emphasize the global aspect, and we do as well. well I want to talk about uh, three primary areas of research, and it's going to be fairly general, but I'm going to be discussing the research programs that we have had over the years. And uh, it's going to be in three different areas, the areas of waterborne diseases, foodborne diseases, and vectorborne diseases. Within the theme of today's talk, of course, we're gonna be dealing mostly with parasites. So we're gonna be looking at eukaryotic organisms, uh, helminths, arthropods, as well as uh, protists. And so we'll cover this wide range of things. It's going to move very quickly, I think, because I have a lot of material to cover. And we'll start with waterborne uh, diseases. And I'll start by making a little advertisement. I have just uh, this week, in fact, launched a new issue of the journal Micro Microorganisms, a special issue that really is One Health in this context. And the title of this special issue is Zoonotic Waterborne Pathogens. And I would just remind you of that or tell you about that as an announcement so that you might even consider contributing to this. Uh, the uh, submissions will be open until next September. So there's quite a while to go. Well, we have, uh, when dealing with waterborne pathogens, we have dealt primarily with three groups, uh, Giardia, a flagellate, uh, which everyone knows about probably, uh, Cryptosporidium parvum and Cryptosporidium hominis, which are very important zoonotic parasites around the world. And also some of the less studied, but very important uh, emerging pathogens, uh, the Microsporidia, Encephalodozoan and Enterocytozoan. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about the life cycles here, other than to point out that sadly, as much as I love the CDC charts and the information they make available, and it truly is an excellent website, I uh, would like to point out that they often don't do as much as I would like them to do in terms of One Health. They do show the environmental aspects of uh, some of these, like in the middle, uh, the person in the water with cryptosporidium. Uh, but with with each of these organisms, you would also have other animals involved. So there is a zoonotic aspect for each of these pathogens. And so we have been studying these. And uh, what we've been doing is working on the primary focus of trying to develop uh, novel large scale monitoring programs, programs that we can share around the world where we can go from our location right here in Georgia, in the United States, uh, to places where we work in Central Europe along the Danube, to places uh, in, for example, Malaysia, or anywhere in the world that there are major waterways, uh, we are trying to develop systems for doing uh, typically inexpensive, 
easy to perform types of biomonitoring to better assess where these pathogens are and when they might break out. These are our students in our laboratory learning to do the basic acid test thing, looking for cryptosporidium. We also use more advanced techniques. We, of course, use PCR. In some of the work that we have done, we have used uh, the fluorescent in situ hybridization technique combined with immunofluorescent antibodies. Uh, this is to, uh, to give us the ability to identify not only the, in the specific species of organism, but also to determine whether or not it is actually viable at the time that we collect it. One of the first things we did is we uh, tested this system on looking at flies, filth flies, things that uh, do not bite people necessarily, califoid flies, sarcophagid flies, musket flies. Uh, these are flies that don't bite people or animals. But they live around them, they feed on them, they feed on their secretions, they feed on their feces, and therefore they are capable of carrying around pathogens. And we wanted to look at the degree to which uh, we could use these flies as biomonitors, but also the degree to which they might be helping to spread pathogens. This gives you an idea of some of the uh, work we did. The first thing we did uh, at Berry College several years ago when we decided to take on this work is we wanted to look at our own campus to determine what we have. These are numbers, just example numbers of for cryptosporidium. We also have similar data for uh, Giardia, for Microsporidia, and for now another a number of other pathogens. But this shows you that within, uh, these are all from fecal samples, uh, all of the animal groups that we have here carry uh, various species and types of cryptosporidium. So uh, there's plenty of material out there to work with. This shows you some of the data, the types of data that we have. Uh, we published this paper in 2007 showing the degree to which cryptosporidium and giardia were carried back and forth between livestock, wildlife, and potentially human populations. You see in the lower left here, the, the major families of flies associated with our livestock and the degree to which cryptosporidium and giardia relatively are found in uh, the flies that um, move around with those particular pathogens. Uh, you can also see, that uh, if you look at the lower right graph, this shows you uh, the different units, not the different flies, but the different uh, primary animal species. So most of the flies that feed in the dairy cattle area, they will stay in the dairy. Most of the feed in with beef would, would stay in the beef areas. Again, with such a large campus and with all of our agricultural units spanning uh, 107 uh, square kilometers, uh, there's sometimes quite a distance between these different animal groups. The primary thing we've been doing though to look at uh, pathogens, waterborne pathogens, is we've been trying to develop strategies for using invasive bivalves as biomonitors. The first one we work with is this one, the Asiatic clam, Corbicula fluminia. Uh, it was introduced many decades ago from Asia into North America and has spread. As you can see, this is a very recent map that actually came out from the United States Geological Survey in uh, just this, this month, this very month. So it's a very up-to-date map of the United States, at least. Obviously, it, does, it also extends into Canada. Uh, but we're, because this is a wide mollusk now, because it's constantly filtering water, because that water is receiving runoff from agricultural, forested, and urban lands, uh, we know that the bivalves can take, can take these pathogens and we can develop uh, methods of going out, getting the bivalves, and uh, placing them in particular locations and so on, so that we can use them to assist us in monitoring programs. The primary one that we've used though is not quite as well distributed. This was an invasive from Europe into North America. Uh, this is the zebra mussel, also a related quagga mussel, both from Europe. They've spread throughout much of the Northern and Central United States and all the way down into the Southern parts as well. And because they occur in very large numbers and are very, uh, high volume filters of water. We've used those a lot for our studies. Our original work, even though we did the original laboratory testing at our laboratories there at uh, Berry College, uh, we went up into the Great Lakes area because this is where the zebra mussels are more common. It also is a place where you have uh, a lot of major cities like Toronto, uh, Detroit, Chicago, and so forth, as well as lots of very rich agricultural land. And we established three areas here for sampling these mollusks. Uh, the area around Toronto, deep cold water from Lake Ontario, uh, the Kingston area, which is a smaller city, and then the upper St. Lawrence River. Kingston and the upper St. Lawrence River 
are surrounded by agricultural lands and forested lands as opposed to the area around Tor Toronto, which is extensively urban. Another thing we've done that's innovative in this work is we have learned to capitalize on navigational buoys. The great thing about these buoys is that they are set at a particular place. Obviously, they're there for uh, ships to know where to go and, and what to avoid. So these go back into the same exact location year after year and remain there. And so we found that by using these as platforms to establish our mollusks, we can have a very good uh, multiple year analysis of what kinds of pathogens are coming and going. And so with these, this is uh, information from the first year that we did these studies. This was back in 2007. And what you're seeing here is uh, Lake Ontario. And we only did 10 buoys because we had to go out to collect uh, the mollusks from all of these, bring them back to the lab, perform the uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization work. Uh, but we found that this was a very effective way. We could, and we also saw that you have Cryptosporidium, Giardia, and several of these Microsporidia that are present through uh, in the water uh, there in Lake Ontario. Here you see a little bit more detail. The, the last graph was just showing you uh, whether or not those mollusks on those particular buoys were uh, were contaminated by the pathogens. Here you can see that you can also start breaking it down. You see these the actual names on the bottom you see are these 10 buoys that we sampled. And some of those are very close to Toronto in the urban runoff area. Some of those are farther down uh, where you get more of the rural runoff area. And you can see a lot of variation there in the specific pathogens that and also uh, note that uh, in the urban area, you actually have a lot fewer pathogens, likely because a lot of the pathogens are coming from the runoff from the agricultural lands. There's extensive dairy in that region, so there are lots of cattle and so forth, as well as deer and so on. After doing that, we decided to go from a very major river system to a smaller river system in an area that uh, had the same kind of zebra mussels, and so we went to Ireland and we established eight sites there, and we looked all along the Shannon River, which is the only navigable river, even though it is quite small relative to the St. Lawrence. It's the navigable river that goes right through the center of Ireland. And uh, we actually did a similar sort of study, and we came up with these basic results that uh, we found 75% of the study sites did have some of these pathogens, and you can see the numbers there for your for yourself. And so Cryptosporidium, Giardia, and two different genera of Microsporidia were present. And uh, so this is uh, also a situation where because we were using the fluorescent in situ hybridization, we were able to determine that 80% of the parasites that we found were viable. Okay, so our conclusions from the Ireland study following up on the St. Lawrence study is that in fact, we were able to determine that the river was seriously polluted by these pathogens. We were able to determine that these mussels were good senator, uh, sentinel monitors for finding them. And it was also the first time actually that human infectious microsporidia were found in a natural navigable waterway. Uh, since these studies were completed in the mid uh, 2000, around 2004, I think is when we published this. Uh, I'm happy to say other people have picked up these methods and have worked with them in, uh, with these same pathogens as well as others, uh, most notably with toxoplasma. And we're actually starting to work with toxoplasma now in a related study here at Berry College. We also have launched other studies at other sites throughout Europe, uh, again, looking at different uh, types of waterways, different sizes of waterways. And I don't need to, uh, all each of those out, you can see them for yourself. Uh, but we're trying to cover, again, we're trying to develop programs that can be used with any navigable waterway where you have uh, buoys out so that you can establish these platforms for sampling. Um, so uh, we, we, we've determined that uh, by looking at insects and mollusks, you can determine a lot about what's going on in these natural environments. And we suggest that uh, we need to continue this sort of work and hopefully other people will pick up on more of it as well. Uh, not just looking at the vertebrate animals, but invertebrates that can influence the environment. Moving from there to vector-borne parasites, we've launched, uh, again, a rather large scale program that unfortunately has been shut down uh, to a large degree by the COVID. We had just launched our program. In fact, we had just done uh, an our first Arctic part of the program 
uh, in northern part of Norway. Uh, we call this program Arctic to the Equator, and we're trying to develop ways that you can quickly go and do general assessments of what type of vector populations are present. And we're wanting, again, to look a lot, across a lot of topographic, ge uh, geographical, climatic areas. And so we call it the Arctic to Equator program. The yellow uh, transects that you see here, we have already done. Uh, the green we had planned, we were supposed to do a Baltic survey in May. We, were, we had to cancel that because of COVID. Uh, we are still scheduled to do this one in the St. Lawrence River uh, and, uh, and scheduled for this coming September. But we just hope that things will be open up right now. Of course, uh, Canada and the United States don't allow travel between our two countries. And so hopefully we will be able to by, uh, by September. But again, the idea was to be able to look at large transects and to do quick samplings of uh, areas to look for major vectors of zoonotic diseases. Uh, the, the most important transect for us here, though, is one close to home, and it's one that we call the Caribbean Appalachian transect. This has been a very important transect for movement of people, animals, and vectors of diseases, as well as pathogens and parasites, from yellow fever to schistosoma. Uh, for many hundreds of years. And so we wanted to look at that carefully because it does describe the way that things can move in and out of North and South America across the Caribbean basin. And uh, this was especially brought to uh, our attention during the last decade because as most of you know, we had two major outbreaks of mosquito-borne viruses that came into the Caribbean basin area. Uh, chikungunya virus came across uh, the Atlantic into the center of the Caribbean and then spread north and south into the continental zones. And then just shortly after that, Zika virus came out, it came from across the Pacific into Brazil and then north into North America. And so there have been broad outbreaks of both of these. Both of those are still present in uh, our whole region, even though neither had been in this area at all uh, prior to the, uh, these outbreaks during this last 10 years. Well, you see there the little yellow stars all over the map. Those are study sites that we have already sampled, and I'm going to show you some of those. Uh, but first, let me say a little bit about uh, our location. Again, uh, you have up in the upper left, this is Georgia. There are several different levels. You have a grad, here's the, co the coast is to the right of Georgia, the Atlantic coast. The Gulf of Mexico is south of that. But you have a gradual rising across the state of Georgia, across the coastal plain into what we call the Piedmont. And then finally, right when you hit Berry College, the center map, uh, Berry College is located right here, just before the tremendous elevation change into the Blue Ridge Mountains of the Appalachians, and especially the colored zone, which is the plateau region of the Southern Appalachians. This is a very important topographic break for the uh, dissemination of disease vectors. It's been known for a long time by general observations that many mosquitoes don't make it across uh, the plateau into the interior part of the United States, and they don't make it as well up into the upper parts. The map on the right here, this is a map from a, a, an ice and snowstorm that we had just one year ago uh, this month. And it shows you, I guess it's better than anything, uh, an actual weather map showing where the snow, sleet, and ice would be occurring on this particular storm. And notice that it extends right down through the Appalachians. So just looking at a flat, uh, map, you don't get the picture. You can see here that if you've got material, if you've got vectors moving up out of the tropics of the Caribbean, across Florida, up through the coastal plain and Piedmont, uh, that they are going to hit a major barrier for dispersal. And so we, we wanted to uh, examine that to better understand these geographical uh, aspects of disease spread. We use a lot of different methods, uh, uh, traditional uh, DG Sentinel traps, uh, CDC traps baited with CO2 and lures. We do dip dipping for larvae uh, and a combination of all those things. We also use this uh, rather controversial method, which is called human line landing catch. It's controversial because, of course, uh, these insects could be carrying a disease, so you don't want them to bite you. But it's a very effective way of especially collecting insects like this Aedes albopictus. Uh, that's a major predator on humans that goes for human blood a lot and can carry a lot of important pathogens, including uh, the pathogens for yellow fever, chikungunya, Zika, and dyrofilaria, which we study a lot at our campus. So just to give you a quick rundown on some of the results we have had, uh, in the Caribbean basin itself, we have 
look primary at ur primarily at urban areas because these are the areas that are most at risk for some of these most important diseases. Uh, and indeed, we've been very effective in finding uh, variations in the distribution of ADZ, the most important disease vector uh, that we have there. Uh, this shows my wife and collaborator, Denise. Uh, she's a natural born uh, Ohio woman, by the way. So that should uh, be interesting to those of you at Ohio State, uh, though she's from the Cincinnati area. Uh, but this shows us in Basseterre, St. Kitts, the capital of St. Kitts, right in the most uh, heavily trafficked part of the city. And the flower pots here are swarming with Aedes aegypti larvae. So this gives us something we can use to advise the local uh, governments about uh, getting rid of some of these pests and uh, saving people from getting disease. Uh, but also you see right here in the U.S. territory of Rico in San Juan, uh, we found that not just flower pots, but uh, flower pots actually were pretty clean in San Juan, but you have water from the rains leaking down into the water meter wells and they fill up with water and then the water fills up with ADZ aegypti larvae. Uh, so this is a new thing that we need to be looking at and advising on. Uh, some other locations where we have found uh, heavy populations of ADZ aegypti, uh, Tortola in the British Virgin Islands, uh, in Roadtown, uh, Charlotte Emily in St. Thomas US Virgin Islands. Uh, these are the last data we've collected in the field because, again, we went on this one expedition in January of this year, just before the COVID shut us down. And again, flower pots, street drains, tires, the corridor fountains, all uh, very heavily populated by uh, Aedes aegypti larvae. And then we continue on up into Florida, one of the wealthiest uh, cities probably in the world, Naples, Florida, within right in among the fancy boutiques and so on, you have lots of uh, Aegis aegypti breeding, as well as some of the local mosquitoes there. Moving on up, then we come to the Berry College, which is at the edge of the mountains. And we have over the last three years uh, found 36 now different species of mosquitoes. And uh, most of these though, the dominant mosquitoes are invasive speed, uh, species like Aedes albopictus, again, very competent vectors of many diseases. You move on up to the mountains, however, you go to Mont Eagle, Tennessee on top of the plateau. And as we expected, you get a tremendous drop in numbers. Uh, for a, a thousand mosquitoes that we collect in Georgia, we move up to the top of the plateau, we get only a quarter of the number, 243 mosquitoes on the plateau. And instead of 36 species, we have only 26 species. So both diversity and numbers of mosquito vectors uh, drop when you move up to the top of the plateau. Well, we're gonna continue with this kind of work as we go along, but it's, uh, you can see here that uh, we've had to do a lot of cancellations. Uh, we, have, we had a uh, Arctic One Health Conference where we were gonna present some of this and do some work uh, in March. That had to be canceled for COVID. The Baltic survey, as I mentioned, was uh, canceled. We've rescheduled. We were scheduled to go out in, into the Caribbean in August, but we had to cancel that. We are now rescheduled for January, but we're not sure if that's going to happen because with the new spike in COVID, uh, things are still being shut down. So uh, we hope we'll be able to uh, do the September St. Lawrence survey. Uh, we're also looking at phlebotomine flies. Uh, I won't say a lot about this, but we're looking at this because it's a primary uh, vector of, uh, uh, of vesicular stomatitis virus here in Georgia, as well as in many places in the United States. And it also is a vector of what is now an emerging disease in North America, uh, leishmaniasis. And leishmaniasis, of course, can be zoonotic. And we're especially concerned about leishmania mexicana and then uh, so leishmania infantum, one of which is cutaneous, the other one visceral. But nevertheless, we are seeing more cases, especially in animals, of these diseases in North America. And so that's why we're starting to survey those. And uh, here you can see that we have uh, actually collected these phlebotomines, Lutzomaya shannoni, both in Georgia and in Tennessee. And uh, it's hard to tell from these maps, again, because these are flat maps. But if, uh, based on what I was just showing you, toll strip that is, has not shown presence of those in the past is the Highland Cumberland Plateau Strip. And so we have been the first to locate new populations of Lutzomaya on top of the Cumberland Plateau, which uh, poses then a threat of the distribution of these diseases. Okay, uh, it's getting, uh, let's see, I, I have, I think just a, a few little minutes. So let me run quickly through foodborne parasites. 
We've done a lot of work with this in many areas. I just wanted to share with you though, a, a really interesting aspect. Uh, we've been looking at the Arctic lately with collaborators in Iceland uh, as well as elsewhere. And there are several zoonotic parasites that are concerns for wild food, wild meat in the Arctic, Toxoplasma, Trichinella, Echinococcus and uh, Mesocystoides that we've been working with. And also in the fish, the Ascaridoid nematodes like Anisacus, Pseudoterranova and so on as well as Diphilobothium tapeworms. I wanted to focus on Mesocystoides. Mesocystoides is a tapeworm parasite that is highly zoonotic. The life cycle has never been completely worked out. And so this is just a couple of ideas of hypo hypothetical life cycles. We know that this uh, organism occurs as a tetrathyridium juvenile in a variety of frogs, rodents, snakes, we also know that it will become an adult in various types of canids and other mammals, and of course, as well in humans. Uh, what we don't know is how it gets from the adult stage over into the amphibian and reptile stage. Uh, that has not yet been worked out, but we're still looking at a lot of these other hosts to try to learn more about how this particular organism uh, operates in nature. And we just have uh, located through our colleague in Iceland, uh, Carl Skirnison, is located, mesocystoid is actually affecting uh, rock ptarmigan there. Rock ptarmigan is widely used as a food material in the Arctic, and so there's a concern. And when these were found, you can see the parasites here on the left, but you can see some of them have these bubbles. The bubbles, as it turns out, we've determined are highly dilated excretory ducts, and also there is a, a hypertrophic uh, tegument, invaginations of the tegument that move inward and join these excretory ducts during a period where we have shown that uh, this, this tapeworm actually gets cancer. And so we determined this actually looking at uh, some material from Spain where these worms would develop uh, bumps, would start dividing aberrantly, proliferating, uh, losing their normal parts and developing these excretory ducts and metal invaginations that look very much like cancer and so about the time we were deciding that these tapeworms were actually getting cancer, and because of the cancer, they were proliferating without control and killing their hosts. There was a paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine by Adis Muhlenbox and his associates at CDC, as well as other institutions, showing death to the human host by a hymenolobus tapeworm that became that engaged in malignant transformation or the development of cancer. We then reported that and we came back at that with a, uh, as you see on the right, a letter to the editor uh, proposing that in fact what we were seeing in uh, various hosts, uh, animal hosts, was the same thing. That uh, the cestodes have a propensity to develop a cancer sort of state and then kill not themselves. They continue to proliferate, but it kills their host. It caused us to go back into the literature and looking at pieces from Prugway, uh, as well as Venezuela in South America in the 1980s, where these men, every bump you see in the skin here is one of these parasites that is wildly proliferating inside the host. They have the same uh, features of malignant transformation that we have now described from many other hosts around the world. This is just a reminder of how the process works. You have normal uh, tissue begin becoming hyperplastic, and then you have it breaking down into a dysplastic condition and finally, the development of cancer with metastasis and invasion of surrounding tissues. And that's exactly what we are seeing uh, in the case of our cestodes. Our cestodes, the mesocystoides, they have the pigmental neoplasia that is similar to the papillary carcinoma that we see in humans in cases of thyroid, breast, or bladder cancer. The excretory duct neoplasia is very similar to what we see in introductal tubular carcinoma with ductal dilation. And again, in humans, this type of cancer is seen best in breast, kidney, and pancreas cancers. And we have now seen this as we're doing this exploration. We have seen this in various types of hosts around the world. We have people sending us materials. Uh, they've been doing it from 1994 till now. And you can see dogs, cats, horses, and humans, but also a snake in Texas, uh, echidnas uh, in Australia, uh, a serval cat in Africa, and then finally the ptarmigan that we collected in the Arctic. And so we're seeing a very interesting One Health situation here where you actually have a, a parasite developing cancer 
and invariably, in every case, and there are now over 100 cases that have been described from various host species, in every case, it has been fatal. There's never been uh, any, any uh, animal or human to survive this condition. With that, I'm gonna thank you and turn it back over to the, the host. I'm sorry if I went over uh, a minute or so, but um, I will then turn it back over. And I guess I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kahn. Uh, I think we can move to the next one and later we can open for questions, Laura. Uh, what do you think? Yes, yes. Uh, we'll save the questions for the panel discussion. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, Dr. Bruce Kahn. Thank you. Okay, uh, now I want to introduce you uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sebastian Leal. He is a veterinarian PhD uh, at the Sao Paulo uh, University in Brazil. He is currently the professor uh, at the Department of Pathology and Preventive Medicine at the Univers uh, University of Conception, Chile. Uh, he also acts as an invited research at the Department of Pediatrics and Molecular uh, Viro Virology and Microbiology at the National School of Tropical Medicine in Texas. He also acts as a postdoc uh, research uh, uh, here in Brazil uh, at the Sao Paulo uh, University. He also serves on editorial boards of several scientific journals. He has many publications, more than 10, uh, 100 publications in PubMed indexed journal. And his main focus is on the study of Argazi ticks, uh, uh, well known as soft ticks mainly on taxonomy of Argas and Ornithodorus, uh, uh, recurrent fever in ticks, and mainly Borrelia species, and the diversity of zoonotic pathogens transmitted by soft ticks. Dr. Leal, thank you for joining us today. And you can share your uh, screen. Um, thank you, Rafael, and thank you, Laura, for, for the invitation. And just wanted to make sure are you uh, looking to full screen now, presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, so in this talk, I want to highlight several points that involve soft ticks as parasites and vectors in South America. And all the results I will show you are the collective efforts of a group of researchers from Brazil, Colombia, Chile, and Uruguay. And we are working in order to bring back the, the study of soft ticks as parasites of human health concern. Um, so I divided this presentation in the following points. First, I will briefly define what soft ticks are. Then I will talk about human parasitism by these arthropods in different scenarios in South America. And finally, I will introduce the importance to study these parasites in South America as they act as vectors of relapsing fever spirochetes. Um, and also I'll give some examples to understand current scenario of this forgotten disease. So, okay. Um, first of all, let's talk about soft ticks, and for that, uh, I need to refer briefly to their taxonomy. So ticks are currently classified in three extant families. The Ixodidae, also known as hard ticks, with 726 species. The monotypic Nutalielide, with one species restricted to South Africa and soft ticks, which belong to the Argacide family that gather 219 species currently. A fourth family of ticks has been proposed based on specimens from Burmese amber. And uh, scientists have uh, proposed the name as Deinocrotonia. In particular, our gasset ticks are, have a global distribution in all the geographic regions, uh, roughly between 45 latitude north and latitude south. And main differences between soft ticks and hard ticks rely on their morphology. Hard ticks 
have a dorsal scutum and their hypostomes, and by hypostomes, I mean the organ by which ticks anchor to the host, which can, you can see in this part of the tick. And the hypostome is anteriorly projected and their bodies have a smooth and hard cuticle, as you can see in this specimen, uh, which corresponds specifically, specifically to uh, an amblyoma species. On the other hand, soft ticks lack a dorsal scutum and they have a ventrally projecting hypostome and their bodies are irregular and leathery and covered by mammillae, as you can see uh, in this picture as this small point and other uh, structures that we call discs that correspond to the insertions of uh, the, uh, the muscles that control the legs. So the majority of soft tick species exhibit more than one nymphal instar, and in some cases they reach a seventh instar. In contrast to hard ticks, female soft ticks feed and then they mate off their hosts and lay small egg batches uh, several times during their lifespan. Moreover, nymphs and adults are rapid feeders. They usually complete their meal in 40 to 60 minutes, some of them in one hour and a half. And this, this behavior is, it is important because uh, it makes them hard to find on their host. Indeed, soft ticks are ridiculous parasites. So we won't be able to find them on their host, but we, uh, if we search in uh, caves, crevices, nests, burrows, and dens that are frequented by mammals or birds, or reptiles or amphibians, for example, we will be able to find them. Importantly, human dwellings in rural areas become ideal niches for soft ticks to occur as well. Finally, these parasites can endure for years without a meal. Therefore, they can act as persistent reservoirs of disease in nature or uh, wherever they establish a colony. So now that we talk uh, a little bit about uh, soft tick biology, uh, I want to show you several examples of soft ticks that parasitize humans in South America. And some of the examples were already published and some of them are the result of recent field work um, performed by our group in different countries along the continent. And as you will see, some of these examples involve the maintenance of domestic animals in south houses, which are constructed with mud and wood. So I will begin uh, with what we know of soft ticks as human parasites in Brazil. So Brazil is a huge country. Um, it can be subdivided in six large ecological domains namely the Amazon rainforest, the Pantanal, uh, Pampa, Atlantic rainforest, the savanna, and Caatinga biomes. In particular, I want you to focus on the savanna and Caatinga biomes, which are in green and orange, uh, respectively. Why? Because it is in these biomes that reports of soft ticks uh, biting human concentrate in, in this country. So this is a typical landscape of the Katinga biome, uh, which you can see in uh, image A. Um, so the Katinga biome is uh, located in the northeastern part of Brazil. And in figure B, you can see um, the most abundant soft tick species that inhabits these arid ecosystems. Um, this species is Ornithodorus riet correai, and it is mainly associated with Cheron rupestris, which is a native rodent that it is widespread along this arid land. Um, however, uh, Ornithodorus riet correai avidly parasitizes humans when available. These images 
illustrate the wound after the bite of this softic species. As you see, it might uh, be rather mild, but this is only when you are bitten by the first time. Since further bites can result in uh, larger reactions as the immunological system gets more sensitive, as depicted in this image, uh, which cor corresponds to my leg in, in, in one of uh, the field works we performed last year. So, um, Orinthodorus red Correai also can colonize houses, and several collections have been made in urban dwellings as well. Um, but this soft tick is not the sole species that has been collected in human dwellings in Brazil. Um, another species associated mainly with bats also has been reported. I mean, um, by this, um, I refer to Ornithodorus mimon, which was collected biting humans inside houses in the savanna biome, specifically in the Minas Gerais state in the middle of Brazil. So Ornithodorus mimon gets into houses with bat that roost in the attics generally. So please keep in mind the following, Ornithodorus riet correai and Ornithodorus mimon readily bite humans if available. So let's continue with two more examples uh, outside from Brazil now. So these are the landscape of Andes Mountains from Peru in the Cajamarca department. A paper published in the 50s reported the collection of ticks in south houses in rural areas of this department. So based on this information, we went there in 2017. And as in many rural areas of the world, domestic animals and humans share the environment more than we would expect. So as you see, animals walk freely on the street and rest wherever the next finds them. And houses often serve as shelter for them. And for a soft tick species in particular that colonizes the walls of these houses. Local people know uh, them as soil ticks. And we were told that in many cases, houses were abandoned because of the intensity of infestation. And this tick corresponds to Ordinitolorus furcosus, and now we are preparing its description using electron microscopy micrographs and um, molecular biology. So houses with, with this kind of, of construction with mud and wood uh, are also present in other localities in South America. And one good example is uh, what we can find in the Cordoba department in Colombia. For instance, this is a typical house constructed with modern wood and also palm tree leaves uh, in the roof. Um, so uh, please note that the walls have several cracks and holes, which are perfect niche for softic to establish. People used to raise chicken and uh, as these birds circulate inside the construction, it is frequent to find nests inside these human dwellings. So these pictures, uh, picture A and B were taken by medical doctor, Dr. Uh, Alvaro Fassini Martinez, who is currently uh, conducting research in this region of Colombia, searching for ornithodorus ticks associated with humans. And recently they found colonies of an Ornithodorus species near Ornithodorus puertorricensis inside these houses. And uh, they are now testing collected specimens for tick-borne diseases. Specifically, uh, their efforts are focusing on the detection of tick-borne relapsing fever uh, spirochetes. So now that I mentioned tick-borne relapsing fever group spirochetes, I want to refer to this bacteria um, because they constitute zoonotic agents and cause disease in humans. So also I will show uh, some current advances on the understanding of this forgotten disease in South America. So tick-borne relapsing fever spirochetes are host-associated uh, bacteria 
classified in the genus Borrelia. They occur in endemic fossils and they switch infections between invertebrates, which in this case correspond to ticks, and vertebrates. Uh, the majority of the species are associated with ticks in the genus Ornithodorus. So the fact that Ornithodorus ticks parasitize humans in several countries in South America becomes a risk for the transmission of these agents to humans. So tick-borne relapsing fever spirochetes induce uh, uh, recurrent febrile episodes because they escape immunological system by changing their surface antigens. Although the disease does not result in fatal cases, spirochetes persist chronically, uh, mainly in nervous tissue, in nervous system. Importantly, tick-borne relapsing fever spirochetes uh, can be recovered and isolated from blood of vertebrates after feeding on them infected soft ticks. So to find the spirochetes, we can observe blood smears uh, of, of infected mice using dark field microscopy. Tick-borne relapsing fever in South America has a long story that I won't be able to tell you completely in this lecture. But uh, long story short, the etiological, etiological agent of South American tick-borne relapsing fever corresponds to Borrelia venezolensis, a spirochete that was initially discovered by the Colombian physician Roberto Franco in early 900s, while he examined blood smears of fever miners at Musu Emerald Mines in Colombia. So after these uh, episodes of, of febrile miners in Colombia, several years later, the disease was also identified in Tachira region in Venezuela by Dr. Pino Po. And to confirm that what they were finding in blood smears was really a relapsing fever spirochete, Dr. Franco and Dr. Pino Po sent infected soft tick specimens um, which were already recognized as the vector of the disease to uh, Emil Brumt, uh, which was a French physician, uh, part of the Paris Academy of Medicine. So Dr. Brumt recognized and recovered the spirochete from infected soft ticks he received and he published the description of both Borrelia venezolensis and its tick vector Ornithodorus uh, venezolensis, which currently we know that corresponds uh, to Ornithodorus rudis. So several years later, uh, in 1927, North American entomologist Lawrence Dunn went to Colombia and identify, identified 16 novel localities with the presence of Ornithodorus rudis and some of these tick in some of this tick, he was able to isolate uh, Borrelia venezolensis. But um, the last work dealing with Ornithodorus rudis was the description of its larvae in uh, 1965 by Coles and collaborators. At this point, at, at this year, I mean, uh, researchers were dealing with other tick-borne diseases, mainly transmitted with, uh, by heart ticks, and also uh, with malaria and mosquito-borne disease. So as you can uh, imagine, uh, soft ticks and tick-borne relapsing fever um, were left to oblivion. And we were lucky because in 2017, uh, while collecting soft ticks in Brazil, specifically in the Maranhão state, we were able to, to collect specimens uh, inside abandoned bird nest. So we examined uh, palm trees uh, with uh, holes that uh, were, were abandoned bird nest were constructed and we found uh, several ornithodorus specimens. So at the time in the field, we, we we didn't identify the species, the species, 
But um, we brought the specimens to the laboratory and um, females laid eggs. And uh, based on the morphology of larvae and adults, we were able to identify uh, these uh, tick specimens as Ornithodorus rudis. So, uh, so now at this point, we, we were excited because we, we had the vector of Borrelia venezolensis and we have living specimens. So we fed them on mice and uh, to see if they were infected with Borrelia and to see any transmission of this spirochete to mice. And after six days observing blood smears under uh, dark field microscopy, we found the spirochetes. And you can see them in this uh, video swimming between red blood cells. There, for example. So uh, with this, we got enough DNA to genetically characterize uh, this spirochete. And now we know that uh, Borrelia venezolensis is phylogenetically closely related with human pathogenic Borrelia turricate that occurs in Southern United States and Northern Mexico. And it, uh, this spirochete is transmitted by Ornithodorus turricata. So now we know that Borrelia venezuelensis still exists uh, in South America. Uh, this study of tick-borne relapsing fever is, uh, becomes a mandatory task. And uh, the finding of, of this spirochete triggered further research in Brazil. And recently, we got molecular evidence of putative novel relapsing fever uh, Borrelia. Um, that we characterize in human biting Ornithodorus species, specifically uh, from Ornithodorus mimon and Ornithodorus riet correai, for which I gave some examples several slides before, and also in um, Ornithodorus hasei, which is a tick that uh, is associated with bats that also bites humans, and uh, we found also DNA of, of Borrelia in a uh, novel species of Ornithodorus genus that we are still describing. So to finish this presentation, I just want to make some final remarks and highlight some questions that uh, rose with the, the evidence we have. So what is the eco-epidemiology of Borrelia venezolensis since this spirochete was identified in uh, the beginning of the, the last uh, the 20th century and now we isolate it again and we don't know if this Borrelia actually uh, parasitized uh, humans or not. Since we found Ornithodorus rudis in nest of wild birds, uh, what is the role of birds in the maintenance of Borrelia venezolensis infections? Uh, put into, into other words, are birds competent hosts for Borrelia venezolensis? What are the mammal hosts of Ornithodorus rudis that could act as reservoirs of uh, Borrelia venezolensis in nature? We don't know since we found these uh, infected ticks in a bird nest. We don't know if, for example, bats could uh, roost in this nest and act as reservoir, as mammal reservoir for this spirochete, or if even uh, some native rodents could be uh, reservoirs as well. So another question is, does relapsing fever Borrelia species detected in other uh, South American ornithodorus that bite humans constitute zoonotic pathogens or not? This is also a thing that we don't know and current efforts are, are now focusing on the isolation of these novel spirochetes. And yeah, one, one last important question is that if uh, does Ornithodorus furcosus in Peru and Ornithodorus, uh, this Ornithodorus species associated with chickens in Colombia uh, harbor relapsing fever Borrelia? We also don't know, but we are working now in, in this time that uh, that COVID-19 has uh, hindered all the laboratory work. We are trying to uh, work 
um, whenever it's possible to find if these ticks are vectors or Borrelia of Borrelia species. And finally, uh, the most important question is, does tick-borne relapsing fever still occur in South America? And this is the main question that we need to solve if we want um, funding to continue studying soft ticks and spirochetes. So with the intention to rescue uh, the study of these ticks and associated pathogens, um, we formed an interdisciplinary group composed by veterinarians and by a medic, uh, Dr. Fasini Martinez. And we have this Instagram account where we upload latest publication on tick-borne relapsing fever in South America. So finally, I would like to acknowledge institutions that funded all the research we conduct, um, especially the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Zootechnia of University of Sao Paulo in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and the Fundação de Amparo Pesquisa do Estado de Sao Paulo, also in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Also, I want to acknowledge all the people involved in field and laboratory work. And this is my email for contact and thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Such wonderful examples of research at the human animal environment interface. Um, Dr. Vieira, would you like to begin the panel discussion? Yes, I would like to, to thank for both uh, outstanding uh, lectures and we can uh, have a very good discussion. Uh, I, I think we could uh, first uh, read uh, the questions that came and later we can, uh, we can discuss. Excellent. All right, so we'll start with the first question we have uh, for Dr. Bruce Kahn from Dr. Wormson Gabreas. Uh, says great global one health work, Dr. Khan, addressing important waterborne disease star diseases starting from local and national issues with true global significance. Kudos. Can you elaborate on the partnership between Berry College and others and give some concrete examples of joint activities or any of these projects that have been jointly done or student exchange? Right. I would be glad to do that. Uh, we, we've been very excited about this and actually We've been engaging with uh, other institutions from around the globe for uh, more than 20 years. Uh, some of our earliest collaborations were in Poland with the uh, Medical University of Warsaw, the Polish Academy of Sciences, and especially with the University of Armia and Missouri. Uh, they have since groups of their graduate students and postdocs who have come here to work uh, either on their dissertations or uh, associated with their other research. And uh, we have worked with them closely in a lot of the waterborne disease monitoring. So a lot of what we've done with, with the insects carrying cryptosporidium with the mollusks and so forth, we've done in collaboration with our Polish colleagues. Uh, also, I just hosted a PhD student to come here uh, and work on our campus uh, on a, another project I didn't get a chance to talk about, but it's quite exciting. And that is looking at the role of dung beetles in sequestering and disseminating uh, various types of waterborne pathogens. Again, primarily looking at cryptosporidium. As it turns out, uh, everybody that works in pasture lands knows that uh, tons of feces get buried every day uh, by dung beetles. And yet there's been very little uh, emphasis on looking at those to determine what role that plays in the epidemiology of those. So uh, we've been doing that. And, and uh, this uh, one, a PhD student from the University of Armia and Majri uh, did that with us. Uh, Slovakia, I just recently hosted one of their PhD students to come and to work on vector-borne diseases. We are comparing the southeastern United States to Central Europe and especially uh, the Tennessee Valley, Tennessee River Valley with the Danube River Valley in uh, Slovakia and Hungary region. And so uh, she came here to work with us and then I uh, reciprocated by going and working with them uh, in Slovakia. And so again, that's an ongoing project where we're looking at comparisons of vector populations in these two uh, somewhat different but, but similar uh, areas of Europe and North America. Uh, the Czech Republic, we've had uh, for several years an ongoing project or series of projects looking at uh, using ultra structural techniques, primarily transmission 
in our trauma microscopy to look at the structure of cestode and trematode eggs and to determine uh, the significance that that plays in transmission of cestodes in the environment as well as the ability for uh, these pathogens to build up in the environment when they're not being transmitted. Uh, so those are just some of the, uh, the, the foreign relationships we've had. All of those have, re have involved reciprocal visits. Uh, I and my students going there, and then they and their students coming here. And so it's, it's been a very nice way to uh, build these networks. Uh, the CDC in Atlanta has been a major partner. Uh, this last talk, uh, excellent talk, by the way, for, uh, from uh, Dr. Munoz Leal. Uh, we actually have work going with uh, rickettsial organisms and tick transmission uh, that we're doing in association with the uh, Centers for Disease Control here on our campus. So we work with them to collect the, uh, the ticks and to do the analyses. Uh, the uh, uh, several, uh, we've got another laboratory at Barry that's working with Chagas disease. And uh, that is done in cooperation with uh, collaborators from the University of It uh, looks like we can cut out for oh. Yep. Um, well, well, we've had a lot of proposals from others who might want to do something. Sorry, so you cut out for the last bit there. Um, another, uh, to add to that question was, how about between US universities, such as Hopkins University um, and the types of partnerships? Uh, the types of partnerships as an undergraduate institution we primarily uh we work on uh shorter term things that undergraduates can get involved with as undergraduate research projects but we have relied uh, heavily on the uh the the water labs uh in the school of public health at johns hopkins to do some of the analyses so for example uh, all of that for us inside you hybridization work that i mentioned uh, that was done at Johns Hopkins, but it involved, we, we were able to send our students up to work with them for uh, two or three weeks at a time and so on. And uh, uh, besides Hopkins, again, there have been, we've had a lot of collaborations with the University of Georgia since they're here in the state, as well as the, uh, the University of Lethbridge in Canada. And so, uh, you know, the, the, each one of those collaborations depends on the nature of, of what we're studying, but they all involve combining field work with uh, laboratory work. Excellent, thank you. Um, so moving into our next question um, from Dr. Achenef. He said, thank you both for your information or your informative presentation. I have a question regarding soft ticks. What type of acaricide can be used to control ticks and how and where to apply, and are they as susceptible as hard ticks? And what is the incidence of a caricide resistance among soft ticks? Yeah, so we can use the same acaricides that we use for uh, hard ticks, but as soft ticks are secretive parasites, it is difficult to uh, for the acaricides that we use, for example, for poron or spodon uh, to get into the crevices where those ticks uh, shelter. So um, also we, we don't have many information if, if using these acaricides, we can eliminate soft ticks, for example, from these infested houses, because uh, mainly because uh, nobody's working on that. And um, so, I think I highlight in my presentation that uh, we are a small group of uh, researchers that are trying to rescue and refloat the interest on soft ticks uh, in South America. And we are, um, we are, uh, we need to go, for example, to rural areas and some, sometimes very uh, away and to, of difficult access to get these parasites. So any control uh, uh, program uh, should start first in recognizing the areas where this parasite occur. And this is something we are uh, 
beginning to to acknowledge now and i hope uh, more researchers will be will engage in this endeavor uh, because we are seeing that uh, soft ticks are really important in terms of human health uh, concern uh, very good uh, uh, I, I want to just uh, complete the question uh, uh, Sebastian is a, a huge friend and a very good uh, collaborating with all our, our research. So, uh, uh, Sebastian, what do you think about soft ticks in another continent? Let's let's keep uh, Africa since we are working together. So we 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 know that uh, we just found uh, Ornithodorus parasitizing a camel from Somalia, and I have another one. Uh, Dr. Alpha here from the Gambia is already is currently a sampling ticks and, and blood samples. What do you think that we could uh, find and, and like recover from soft ticks uh, descriptions in Africa and, and, and potential zoonotic pathogens there? And uh, recover this information and apply it to South America? Yeah, so in Africa, they have more experience with soft ticks and uh, mainly uh, tick-borne relapsing fever. Um, but the main thing is that this disease is uh, somewhat obscured by other uh, diseases that are, are, I don't know if more prevalent, but they they're attract more the attention of uh, physicians and veterinarians. So uh, main thing that we need to, to know now uh, or to, to make is to educate veterinarians uh, about soft ticks and uh, tick-borne relapsing fever. And that is something that has been made in Africa. And uh, there, is, there are many uh, publications that highlight, for example, that um, people that is infected with malaria also can have these um, borrelial infections and in occurring both at the same time. And it is something that it is more common than we think. And to, to control these ticks, we, we need to, to have something in mind that um, ticks occur in on the host, but also they stay in the environment. And this is the most difficult part because they spend most of their lifespan on the environment. And even if we treat the infestation on animals, uh, it will be difficult to eliminate them because they stay uh, on, on the substrate, for example, where these animals lay during the night. So. Um, another thing that is important for soft ticks is that they are related to uh, anthropic uh, rodent species, for example. And if we control these rodents, then maybe we can control uh, soft ticks that are associated to them and uh, in that way diminish the, the quantity of ticks in Deter, um, some areas. Very good. I want to make a comment to bring uh, Dr. Kahn for the discussion. Uh, uh, we are is starting now a, a study with febrile patients from uh, East Africa, uh, and we will look for uh, co infectious genes in general, but mainly uh, arbovirus, such as Zika and Chikungunya and dengue fever. So, uh, Dr. Kong has mentioned about uh, his. Uh, a paper that he's, he has published on 2007 uh, uh, regarding uh, flies as, ve as vectors of uh, Cryptosporidium and Giardia. And I would like to bring uh, attention for a paper that he published in 2015 uh, regarding international adoptees and refugees in the United States. So uh, since we are in the COVID area, uh, era, so what, uh, what were, were, can be the vectors and vector-borne disease, and if they also can uh, act as, of course, as a mechanical vector of uh, antimicrobial-resistant uh, bacteria, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, during this pandemic? Uh, 
<clears throat> well, that's a great question. And I uh, thank you for uh, noticing that uh, paper that we published, uh, this review. Uh, we have had a lot of concern, of course, about what's going on with international adoptees. A lot of people are talking, you know, about international students uh, and all of us in the scientific community, of course, have been concerned about our own travel or inability to travel during this. But this is taking a very hard toll on, uh, there are so many children uh, in many parts of the world that are looking for new homes. Uh, there are parents who want to take them. And of course, this uh, COVID situation has been just devastating for that. Uh, it's put tremendous strain on. Uh, one of the things I think, one of the things I am concerned about is uh, early on in the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of talk about, uh, about immigrants in general, uh, but uh, refugees and adoptees in particular being sources of new diseases coming in. And so it, it turned, it, it, made some people wonder if it was a good practice. And uh, I hope that that's, we would never think that way. I hope we will always remain very open, that we will especially be concerned about uh, the concerns of refugees and especially children. Uh, some people have suggested that if someone has a disease, they should not be allowed to, to immigrate. That's, uh, that's terrible. No, that's that, if anything, that's, it's the opposite. Uh, by getting someone into the United States in particular, we can help to treat their diseases. And uh, a, a health condition, in my opinion, should never be a reason to deny someone the ability to uh, immigrate into a country or for a child to be adopted. Uh, in terms of the relation to vector-borne disease, uh, you know, that's a very critical thing because I think often where we missed, where we made mistakes with chikungunya and Zika coming into the Western Hemisphere is uh, I had been trying for years to warn our public health authorities that even if the disease was not present yet, so in 2010, we didn't have chikungunya or Zika here, but I tried to tell them these things are going to come because we have the mosquito populations. If you already have the vector populations established, any of these diseases that can be transmitted by that vector could potentially come in and we were prime for an outbreak. In fact, I have to be a complimentary uh, very much of the Brazilian government. In 2010, I was contacted by the Brazilian government. At that time, they were looking at uh, the World Cup coming into Brazil. They were looking at the Summer Olympics coming into Brazil. They took a proactive stance and tried to work with me. At, at that time, I was uh, working with the State Department. Uh, they wanted to work on this because they were concerned about these large groups of people coming into Brazil into an area where they knew they had uh, Aedes aegypti. Uh, unfortunately, the United States was not, I think, cooperative enough. And then later, when we had the outbreaks of chikungunya and Zika, and we had already been struggling with dengue, uh, uh, then they, they acted as though it was new. But no, I think uh, if we pay more attention to the vectors, uh, we will be better able to stop the next major outbreak like that uh, and not just wait for sick people to show up. Very good, Dr. Kohn. We, we, we have some great examples. Uh, you, you, you mentioned in 2010, the first case of chikungunya arrived here in Brazil. It, it, we estimate that in 2011 and considering our, our uh, intensity of AIDS, HIPTI, uh, we, we definitely underestimated the, the, the vectors here. So uh, another question I would like to make is, Dr. Uh, Leo, we, uh, since you lived here in Brazil, so physicians here, uh, usually uh, in endemic area, areas, they, they used to, when receive febrile patients during the summer, they think, oh, it's dengue and Zika or whatever and they just uh, forget about uh, differential diagnosis. And that's why we lost so many patients with uh, Rocky, uh, Brazilian Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So what do you think that we could find mainly in rural areas or in rural settlements that we have here in Brazil uh, regarding Borrelia species? So yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, so uh, tick-borne relapsing fever is, uh, is a neglected disease to my, in my view in, in South America and also in Brazil. Why? Because we found the ticks 
infected. And we have evidence that these ticks are, they bite humans. So, and also there is no education to physicians or people in the medical area that this, uh, this disease exists. So um, main thing, it is education. And for that, uh, we are trying to uh, put this research uh, on high impact uh, journals to make it make this uh, in, information influence all these physicians. And um, this is the first step. Then the second step will be to design, for example, a serological um, a test to see the exposure to this uh, Borrelia. But um, since we have the isolate of Borrelia benezolensis, we, we've started a collaboration with uh, Job Lopez Laboratory, uh, the um, Baylor College of Medicine uh, in Houston. And uh, one of the objectives is to design this serological um, test and then try to apply this uh, first in the endemic areas where we isolate this Borrelia. Uh, that is to say in Northern Brazil. But also we have all these other orthodontics that are uh, that harbor DNA of Borrelia and we think that they can act also as vectors of these novel species. And the main thing now is try isolations of these uh, species and uh, have these specific antigens and also try to design these uh, serological tests. But we are in the initial phase of uh, studying this uh, disease in mainly in Brazil. But if we start with uh, Brazil, then we can spread this model to other countries. Uh, for example, in Colombia, which, which was the first country uh, where this disease was reported. And then Venezuela, okay, Venezuela is difficult now, we don't know. But for example, in Peru, we don't know what is happening. And, and yeah, but in uh, short, the main thing is education first of physicians and try to spread the word about this disease that is not, uh, it's not an illusion, it, it is uh, real. We have those asparagus in Brazil. Very good, very good. We have two more questions on before the final remarks. So uh, Dr. Abdallah Ibrahim from Somalia his question is uh, about uh, information about lice relapsing fever in correlation with Ornithodoros uh, relapsing fever in South America, if you have any uh, information. Yeah, um, concerning uh, lice-borne relapsing fever, we have uh, several studies, but all these studies are, are from the first half of uh, the last century. So uh, there are old studies and mainly there, there were fo a fossil of uh, um, uh, Lausborn relapsing fever in Peru, in the Peruvian Andes. But this is just um, a, a past story and now we don't know what is happening. So this is another part of the, the research on relapsing fever Borrelia that needs to be, uh, that needs attention and needs to be uh, re-studied. And, and yeah, that's, we don't know uh, anything. So another question is from uh, Adriana Diaz. Uh, she asks if you, uh, have any information about soft ticks in Europe and which, which are the main species uh, present there? Yeah, I, I don't know the, the exact number, but I can tell you some uh, important species. Um, we have, for example, uh, Ornithodorus erraticus in Southern Spain and Portugal. And this tick is 
the vector of uh, Borrelia hispanica, for example. And this Borrelia is also a zoonotic pathogen. Um, in Europe, you can also find some populations of Ornithodoros. Um, uh, what was the name in Ukraine and this part? Um, Ornithodorus verrucosus. And this Ornithodorus is the vector of um, uh, another Borrelia species that also infects humans. And then you have uh, several Ornithodorus species associated with bats. There are some reports of spirochetes in bats uh, in England and also in Spain, but the ones from Spain are also from early 900s. So uh, yeah, the, in, in Europe, main vectors are Ornithodorus uh, erraticus in Spain and Portugal, and then the other one, the Verrucosus in Ukraine, Slovakia, and all those countries. Very good. Uh, I would like to make some uh, final comments. We, we, we had outstanding uh, lectures this morning and you both uh, highlighted uh, mainly uh, the reason Go High exists. So we, we all agree that we really need this interconnection and collaborative studies and really engage uh, people on capacity building, many uh, in, in screening and look for uh, vectors to map vectors and later uh, capacity uh, physicians to look mainly for the differential diagnosis of this disease that are mainly uh, forgotten uh, for, year, for years. So uh, this is uh, what we have this morning. I would like to give you the final remarks for you, Dr. Khan and later Dr. Leal. So uh, just to respond, I, uh, I was uh, very interested in the, the second presentation, uh, Dr. Leal, uh, and I had some other questions. So we will, hopefully we will continue to be in touch. Uh, we are, we're considering starting work here on hippoboscids or KEDS, if you're very familiar with those. And uh, uh, I was wondering if you have been, if, if you have looked at those uh, insects uh, there in South America. But uh, let me just uh, finish. I know we've got a short time. So let me uh, once again, just thank uh, the, the host, uh, the moderator and uh, the Go High program. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, this has been an excellent series and I especially enjoyed today. Okay, so. Go ahead. Okay, can I answer like, very quickly? Um, yeah, sure, we, we, we can stay in touch. And yeah, so hypoposite flies, you were uh, wondering? So, yeah, yes. So these flies are, are so difficult to identify first. And um, I don't know if you know any specialist, but, but yes, we, we, we have many species here. Uh, in birds and also in bats, but um, some of them are positive for uh, Bartonella species, mm. but also uh, we don't know if this Bartonella are just, uh, they came together when they suck blood from their mm. hosts or they actually are uh, vectors of this bacteria. But but yes, this is, this is a, a an interesting line of research, mm -hmm. um, but we—I I don't know if you know—but an specialist, I mean, uh, a taxonomist that could help to identify all the diversity we have, uh, because I think that as in soft ticks, uh, taxonomists in other groups of arthropods are uh, threatened, are in uh, extinction. Because, mm -hmm. because now uh, all, all the attention is into uh, molecular biology and then uh, all uh, like taxonomy is, is not uh, trespassed. The information is not trespassed. So, so yeah, it would be great to work in this group of deep terms. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
And yeah, final remarks. So thank you, uh, thank you, Laura, and thank you, uh, Rafael, for the invitation. And I'm I'm glad to 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 share all uh, this panel with uh, with Bruce also. And um, and yeah, thank you very much. And thank you so much on behalf of GoHi. Thank you all for your wonderful presentations and moderation and discussion. And um, Dr. Rafael, did you have a final comments as well? No, I, I already thank you both and really uh, you, Laura, and Dr. Gebrias for for this uh, wonderful uh, webinar, a series of webinars during this pandemic uh, crisis. So thank you again. Yes, thanks so much. Um, such a wonderful discussion again. Thank you all. And uh, our next presentation will be in December. Our webinar will be on pharmacology and One Health, and that will be on the 17th of December. So thank you so much for joining us. And I will be sending out the recording hopefully later today. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.